Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a form for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. And today I'm happy to present a special episode that I've hinted about on previous shows. At the end of October, I had the great fortune of attending the American Society for Gravitational and Space Research's annual meeting in Seattle, Washington. It was a great event that brought together researchers from many fields, and I had the good fortune of speaking with many of the researchers. We'll bring you those interviews shortly, but first up is Dr. Cindy Martin-Brennan, who's the Executive Director of ASGSR, and she told me a little bit about the organization, the meeting, and the history of some of this work. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for chatting with me. Um, before we get too far into things today, I was hoping you could give me a little bit of a background of the organization uh, and sort of, you know, when it was founded and that sort of thing. So the organization used to be called the American Society for Gravitational and Space Biology. Back in uh, 1984 is when it was founded, and it was mostly folks who were doing biology in space, starting back from way in the Apollo era um, all the way through to where we are now with the International Space Station. In 2012, um, we thought it would be very beneficial to have physical scientists join our organization. So that's when we became ASGSR, which is our, our short acronym name. Okay, and, and kind of what angle does that physical research take? Well, there's, for instance, fluids. Okay, there's a very common, there's differently common issues with fluids in space, with biological mm -hmm. fluids, and right. then there's issues with fluids in space for if you're trying to do physics. Um, there's definitely some commonality, and we thought integrating both the scientists, the physical scientists, and the life sciences together would just make a much better integration of an experiment, and then each other understand each other's worlds and their challenges. So you're getting those interdisciplinary opportunities exactly. that you wouldn't have if you were strictly biology focused. Right, right. How is this research conducted? You know, I, I expect we'll hear a little bit about um, you know, work that's done with parabolic flights and work on the International Space Station, uh, but how are these experiments done? So there, it's kind of funny. It's done from you know ground to low Earth orbit, which is where the International Space Station is now. Of course, eventually we want to go to the Moon and Mars. That's been something that the president has spoken about, and the president before that, and the president before that. So it's a pretty consistent strategy the United States wants to continue to undertake. But how it's conducted right now? Most of the research is done in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. Again, it's an international program. The U.S. is a big partner in it with other countries. Um, we get rides from uh, companies such as SpaceX um, and Orbital, uh, also located uh, here in the United States. We put the experiments on the vehicles. A lot of the experiments have to be conditioned. Uh, they have to be at the right temperature, etc. And they go up through these vehicles to the International Space Station where they get carried out by the astronauts. What's, what's the aim behind a lot of this research? You know, is it future space exploration and ensuring that, you know, uh, we'll be able to create environments in space that are suitable for humans, or uh, you know, are there also applications for life here on Earth? So the answer is yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's for exploration, like I said. You know, the U.S. wants to go to the to Moon and, and Mars eventually. Um, so you have to learn a lot of things because uh, gravity is different in those locations. Um, so some of the research is enabling us to get to those locations you know, with humans, probably with robots first, and then eventually with humans. But a lot of this stuff actually kind of benefits life on Earth. Um, so it's kind of twofold. It enables exploration, and the research is enabled by exploration. Can we talk a little bit about the meeting itself? Um, it's held annually, and it, is, it gets everybody a chance to kind of come together to discuss the research. Um, you know, what kind of things come out of these meetings? I, I think, well, for the scientists, they're from all over the world, right? We have folks from China here, we have folks from Germany, Canada, they're all over the world. Even though it's American Society for Gravitational Space Research, it is an international organization. So it allows the scientists to hear what's going on. They, everybody will give their technical presentations, what they're doing in their science, you know, in their laboratory, in their cubby. Um, but they get out, they get to talk to each other, find out what's going in each other's labs, find places for collaboration, whether it's national or international collaborations. It's really an opportunity for the scientists to exchange ideas. We have students here. We have a lot of students. We have high school students who are going to be coming in in a couple of days. We have undergraduate and graduate students. So we're, it's a very fresh environment for the students, the, the ones who want to do space research. They come here and they learn about what their peers are doing, and they get to learn from their peers. So it's, it's a great environment to, for the students and then for the scientists themselves. Okay, and so... You know, what sort of areas of research, I think we've talked about it a little bit already, um, but, you know, kind of what are, what are the things that people will be uh, presenting at this meeting? 
So you're going to hear a variety of stuff, everything from plant biology. You know, we've seen, most folks have seen The Martian. So a lot of that movie is based in science, and a lot of our scientists actually do that research. You know, the potato, I have people who have grown potatoes not Mar- on Mars, but, you know, they've simulated that in, in centrifuges here on, on the ground. We'll hear about human physiology. You know, this morning we had a Dr. John Clark uh, talk about uh, some of the ballooning experiments where people go up to the, you know, way high in the stratosphere and what the, phys- the physiological effects are in space. Um, we'll hear, like I said, the physical scientists here, we'll hear about combustion in space. We hear about how there's cool flames. Um, we'll hear about that, and we'll hear about cold atom labs. So just the gamut of life and physical science, the stuff we see on the ground, what's going on in space with it. So really just a broad sort of multidisciplinary focus on all things, you know, uh, having to do with space, microgravity, yeah. research up there. Yes. That's great. And we'll hear more from Cindy later in the podcast. But before that, I wanted to get to the first chat we have directly about science. And that's with Dr. Annalisa Paul and Dr. Rob Furl. Dr. Paul is a professor in horticultural sciences and plant molecular biology at the University of Florida. And Dr. Furl is the director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Biotechnology Research, also at the University of Florida. And they talk to me about plants in space, you know, how they're grown, how they respond to zero gravity, and how they might be used on long-term missions. Uh, It's a great topic. Topic, and let's let them do the talking. So we'll go to it right now. Thank you both very much for joining me today. You're, You're welcome. Very welcome. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure our, to be here. Exactly. Um, so one of the first questions for me, you know, sort of a, a layperson is, why do we need to learn about plant growth in space? What's the, what's the motivation behind that? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons, lots of reasons why we want to grow plants in space. But one of the reasons is, is that we're taking plants with us when we leave this planet. And so as we go exploring to Mars or even extended periods in our own Earth orbit, we need to know how to grow plants, how they respond to that novel environment. And this is so that if we were, if we were traveling to a place like Mars, say, um, we'd have something to eat. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and it's a little more complicated than that. Just as plants form here on Earth, the biosystem in which we as humans live, the idea is, is that living in another planetary system or even in a vehicle for a long period of time, you'd like an ecosystem that basically will support you. The more we can bring plants into the ecosystem that supports us as astronauts and explorers, and generally the better off we will be, the healthier we will be. Okay, and so now I'm wondering, you know, uh, you've made the case well, but how do you affect that study? You know, uh, I saw something on parabolic flights on, <laughs> on airplanes. How, how can you learn anything in that kind of quick examination? Well, I think you actually might be surprised at, the, at how much you can get done in 30 seconds of, of no gravity. Uh, one of the things that is special about what we get to do is that it's experiential for us as scientists as well as uh, as investigators as well as for the organism that we are subjecting to that environment. How much can you get done in 20 seconds of zero gravity? How, gee, there's even things you can do in a drop tower that gives you five seconds of zero gravity that are informative. There's a lot of biology that can happen in the first few seconds of a transition to a different gravity. So... What's an example of that? You know, I, I think in that period of time I would be able to uh, become frightened, and that's probably about it. <laughs> well, um, when you become frightened, what happens to you? It happens fast, and your body responds very quickly. All of a sudden, you got this adrenaline rush. Uh, maybe the hairs go up on the back of your neck. All that stuff happens fast. Well, if you're a plant, and all of a sudden you're thrown into a microgravity environment, you're thinking to yourself, well, what is this? I better turn on a whole bunch of genes and start the processes going to adapt to something that I don't know what's going on. And they do that quickly. Okay, and what, and what sort of things do you see when you study that model species in um, zero or low gravity environments? What we primarily look at right now is ex- changes in gene expression. And we try to understand how those changes in gene expression are correlated with the metabolisms that have to be different in that environment. We use that as one measure, one metabolic mm, sort of barcode of what's happening inside the organism so that we can understand the physiological changes, the physiological differences of living in space versus being on the ground. And you asked about 
what can we learn in a short period of time? Usually those are, are sort of physiological membrane changes, molecular changes that have to do with rapid signaling inside of cells. One of the things that we spend a lot of time with on our space station samples is understanding the difference in the structure of the cell and the structure of, uh, of the chemicals that make up cells so that we can understand uh, how a plant that's used to living in one gravity lives without any gravity. And can you tell me a little bit more about some of that um, space station research? Uh, you know, what kind of experiments are being done there? Well, did a number of actually different kinds of experiments on the space station, and one experiment gives you answers, and that leads to more questions, and so on, and so we've done a, an interesting continuum of experiments. The bottom line that we've seen is that um, as plants try to physiologically adapt to the microgravity environment, most of the things that we look at, they germinate, they grow, they spend the entire lives on the space station, as opposed to taking a live plant up there and seeing how it responds. All these guys have grown on the space station their entire lives. And the plants that grow on the space station have different uh, mechanisms by which they control their cell walls, for instance. We call this cell wall remodeling. The way they respond to certain types of stress responses, different things that on the, the terrestrial environment on Earth, they might see as a threat on the space station. They view it as some kind of strange environment that they have to react to. So many things that we're, we're discovering may or may not really be needed for physiological adaptation, but certainly plants are responding in a number of different ways that, at least from their perspective, they're trying to adapt. M much of the world, even much of the science world, doesn't know what the space station is capable of doing. Yeah, so well, we, we think of ourselves as, as bench scientists or we go out into the field and we, and we interact with the science and stuff. You've got to realize there's people up there waiting to do your project when it arrives in the Dragon space capsule. They want to pull it out. They want to get it out. They want to put it in the instruments. They want to, they, there's benches for them to work on. There's things, there's analytics they can do. Um, and they the, like it. They like it. And the, 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 the world of, you know, in the old days, you'd box up an experiment, you'd send it to space, and then it would come back. Now you, you send something up, uh, you watch in real time as the astronaut oh, cool. opens it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You watch in real time, then they open it up, then they'll grab the microphone and ask you a question. They'll hold it up to the video and say, does this look right? Oh, that's great. It is. Yeah, you know? that's fantastic. And the, that's the kind of science that a lot of people don't realize is actually happening right now, yeah. every day. That's fascinating research. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about the meeting. Uh, you know, are, are there any particular sessions that you're really looking forward to seeing or presenting at yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Lots. <laughs> the, I figured that would be the answer. <laughs> the, oh, so the, there's, there are a lot of facets to that question that are really, really worth tugging on for at least a minute. You got to realize this. We're entering an era where the amount of change happening on a sort of annual basis in terms of capabilities is really dramatic. We are now getting ready to go outside the Van Allen belts for the first time in over forty years. We wow. haven't we haven't <laughs> been we haven't been to the moon since the Apollo era. That means we haven't sampled the cosmic radiation environment in its truest sense since genes have been sequenced, <laughs> right? We, there's, there haven't been genomes out there. So you get a lot of work to back. do, basically. No, it's not that we have a lot of work to do, it's that we have a lot of opportunity Absolutely. to do yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, it is really, really... Uh, sort of important, not only because we get to sample that strange and new environment, but we get to contribute to the to the whole exploration process by knowing better how to be biology in space. Yeah. Right. And getting together in a meeting like this gives you an opportunity to talk to others in the field and you know set priorities and plan, prepare. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so so there's sort of three lobes to this experiment to the okay. to this meeting. One is is like you just said, is, is pure 
talking to your colleagues, talking to other people in the field, and getting insight into what people are doing and what's available out there as far as data goes. The other lobe is what sort of also what Rob was alluding to is that uh, NASA and CASIS both support this meeting very strongly in letting us know what kind of opportunities are out there, what are the kind of things that headquarters is thinking about, and how can they help us implement the kind of work we think should be done, and, and they listen to us, and we listen to them, and so it makes a pretty pretty good feedback for the kind of work that's going to be happening in these, as we go boldly in um, new directions here. And I think that sounds like a great note to leave it on. We've got a lot to look forward to. Uh, thank you both very much for joining me. You're welcome. Next up, I was lucky enough to talk to Dr. Michael Roberts. He's the Deputy Chief Scientist at the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, or CASIS. And they're the managers of the National Laboratory on the International Space Station, which we've talked about a bit already, but we'll discuss in more depth as we go. Now, Dr. Roberts talked to me a bit about that role, but we also chatted about microbiomes in space. And microbiomes are something that will be familiar for anyone who follows science news. We've talked a lot about those microorganism communities in Earth systems on other episodes of the podcast. But there are some very different implications for them and for the people living with them in the space environment. But I'll let Dr. Roberts explain that. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, before we get too far into um, the specifics, I was hoping you'd give us a very basic idea of what's a microbiome. Very good question, and it means different things to different people. It's not one of those terms that everybody hears it and immediately the light bulb goes off. So microbiomes, uh, from the viewpoint of those who work with them, represent all of the microbial organisms that are present in a particular environment. And those microbial organisms run the gamut from bacteria that we know from going to the doctor's office and having a throat swab that tells you you've got strep throat, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the viruses that cause our colds and flus and, and viruses that uh, cause other diseases, also includes fungi. So when you're looking at the microbiome, you're trying to understand all of the, the organisms that are small enough to be unseen with the naked eye but we've now learned over the past few years have a very important impact upon the function of that environment in which they live and the health of our bodies as well. Okay, great. That gives us a, a baseline idea of mm -hmm. uh, microbiomes as a very general matter. How are they different in space? Uh, they're very different. So one of the features of, of life in the space environment is that the heavier things don't settle down to the bottom and the lighter things don't float up to the top. And Although you might think that uh, bacteria and viruses don't care that much about the up and the bottom right. uh, of things, it actually has a tremendous impact upon the way they interact with their environment the same way as it does for larger organisms like humans. Sure. So there are impacts upon the way those organisms interact with those environment, and those, translates, those translate into changes in both the composition of the microbiome, who is there. Yeah. It also translates into changes into what they're doing and how they interact with it. So one of the sessions at ASGSR this year is focused on biofilms. Um, biofilms have received a lot of press, most of it bad, over the past few years because they're associations of microorganisms that, foam, uh, that form the, uh, the equivalent of, of townhomes and duplexes in certain environments. And those biofilms have different responses to the environment, for example, that enable them to avoid uh, being killed by antibiotics or other things that we might use to control them. The space environment does similar things. It affects the way the microbes live and interact with their environment, and it changes the way that we can uh, treat them. And now, are they a problem in space, or are they, are they something you knock down, or are they beneficial as well? Um, it depends who, there are a problem, it depends who you talk to, how big of a problem they are. Okay. Um, right now on the International Space Station, um, we have to uh, still recycle the air and the water that we use up there in order to make it more efficient. We, it, even though the, uh, the International Space Station just operates a couple of hundred miles above the Earth, it's a very harsh environment in space, so at all times the crew have to live inside of a pressure vessel. So. The treatment of water that they can use for drinking is very important. It costs a lot of money and takes a lot of resources to launch water continuing to the International Space Station. So the engineers have built systems that can recover water from the humidity condensate, which is a 
fancy way of saying the humidity that's in the air. Right. Most of that comes from um, the, the expiration of the astronauts. They also recycle urine and, and change it into drinking water for the crew. Uh, there's a lot of um, very useful nutrients in that urine that the microbes can use. So microbes live in some of those systems. They form biofilms that can clog very small pores in the system. So there have been instances where biofilms have caused issues with the water recovery and water treatment systems. Um, another potential issue we have is that water that is launched from Earth typically has a biocide or something in it to knock back microbial growth in it. In some cases, those water sources get contaminated just as they would here on Earth. The same as if uh, you were to buy a water bottle at the airport and decide, I'm too cheap to throw it away, I'm going to continue drinking out of it and keep refilling it. If you don't wash it out, you're going to get microbial growth in there. Right. I'm, I'm a hiker, and I uh, reuse my water bottles all the time, and I've now been made nervous. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, we, have these, you know, we have these biofilms in the water system in one way or another. Um, Obviously, that has a number of impacts. How do you study that? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, the International Space Station is, uh, is an active working environment for the crew, right? So we've mm -hmm. had six crew members continuously on orbit for almost 17 years, yeah. probably 17 years next week. Uh, so essentially what we've done is built uh, the ultimate engineered environment, right? You can't open a window or a door on the International Space Station and let fresh air come in, right? So you have an environment where uh, a lot of the microbes that populate that environment uh, are brought up on the crew members themselves and live and have it there. So to study those microbes, it really depends on what your question is. The folks who uh, want to make sure that the astronauts are healthy and happy in that environment, mm -hmm. the flight doctors and flight surgeons, they study the microbes in there by the way you the way a physician studies you when you go to the doctor's office and be sick. They'll take a swab or they'll look at your throat or, or take a, a sample mm -hmm. of you to understand better. The folks who work from the engineering side of the house who work on those water control systems, they study those systems by looking at the quality of the water that comes out of the pipe. And they will see examples in there where there may be microbes in the system because the rate of flow is decreased or they'll see discoloration of the water or they'll see an increase in carbon content or some other measure of it. From a scientist's perspective, you think about designing an experiment where you want to ask a very specific question. So for that case, typically, you know, as a scientist, we simplify the question we want to ask and try to understand all of the different variables in the system. So typically, people have flown bacteria in some sort of a culture vessel to make them grow in that environment and simply let them grow in the right. microgravity environment over a period of time. So the equivalent of a Petri dish. Exactly. Okay. Petri dish or uh, uh, throw them into a test tube or we have some fancier devices now that let you flow liquids through and make biofilms you know, in real time. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, the meeting and, and why we're here. Um, so what's your organization's relationship uh, to ASGSR? and to the lab itself. Yeah, so the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space is a, a not-for-profit organization. We're relatively young. We, we came into creation in 2011. Um, we got our start through a cooperative agreement with NASA uh, to manage the ISS National Lab. The ISS National Lab itself is a relatively new construct. The International Space Station itself uh, started operating in the year 2000 mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, crew members being on board. In 2005, the U.S. Congress declared the U.S. operating segment of the International Space Station as a national lab. The concept there was that much as the Department of Energy operates national labs here on Earth, there should be an opportunity for investigators who need access to the space environment to have access to a laboratory that operates there. So by designating part of the International Space Station as a national laboratory in 2005, the U.S. Congress was opening the door for investigators who were funded by institutions other than NASA. And those users extended to commercial companies who may have ideas about things they would like to do in the space environment, but found it prohibitively expensive or just too difficult to do things there. So the designation as a national lab allows all sorts of third parties to do science in space. Absolutely, and technology development. So there are uh, companies that we work with, uh, pharmaceutical companies, who are interested in microgravity because it functions as an accelerated model of disease progression. Um, okay. One of the cool things about 
being in microgravity is that you can float around in space and not have to ambulate, move around with your legs. The downside to that, though, is that your bones and muscles react to that physical unloading, and your bone actually starts to shed a little bit of the calcium right. that it has in it. Same things happen with muscles. They begin to weaken over time because you tend not to use your legs as much as you do right. your arms and other things there. For pharmaceutical companies, if you were to fly a model organism such as a mouse or a rat in that environment who have much shorter lifespans than humans, exposure to that microgravity environment for a month represents almost a third of the, the organism's life cycle right. and represents a significant loss of bone mineral density, so much so that even flying a young mouse uh, in space for a few months makes it look like a, a post-osteoporotic or a post-menopausal mouse developing osteoporosis, a disease which we see here on Earth. So we can study all those models in, in the space station and then take that learning back to Earth. Absolutely. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the meeting. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's CASIS doing here? You know, how, are you, how are you participating? Right. So uh, one of the uh, even before the uh, the ASGSR meeting itself started, uh, we worked with our NASA colleagues to host a rodent research workshop. Um, there are uh, a variety of uh, um, investigators who are interested in understanding the way microgravity impacts biological systems, living living organisms, and environment. And many of them use mouse and rat models to do that. So we've hosted a, a workshop at this meeting and a, and a meeting earlier this year to reach out to those communities to understand what they've learned over the past few years and ways that we can improve their access to the space environment to continue their research. We've also uh, developed partnerships with the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health who are sponsoring research utilizing the International Space Station. And again, that's the major concept behind the ISS National Lab is opening it up to additional investigators who can seek funding from sources other than NASA or in addition to NASA. Well, thank you very much. We'll look forward to hearing more about the results of those experiments. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. After talking to Dr. Roberts, I had a chance to chat with Dr. Ken Saban, also a CASIS employee, about a subject that was a completely new one to me, and that's macromolecular crystal growth in zero gravity. And like so many of the topics we discussed in Seattle, this one has broad implications for a wide number of fields, and the research is being done in the one place it can be done, on the International Space Station. But I'll let Dr. Saban explain. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's good to be here today. So we're going to talk today about macromolecular crystal growth, and that is a topic I know very little about, and I was hoping you could, uh, you could just introduce me to it. Well, a crystal growth is important for a lot of different reasons, and it's become a bigger point of interest, especially with the fact that you can potentially get even better crystals in microgravity. So there's been a lot of effort to try to do more experiments of those types on station, and it has impacts in, in many different fields. Uh, I'm most familiar with the work that's done um, around a drug design. So if you understand what the protein target is you're going after, you can start to think about exactly what the molecular shape of um, a chemical entity you're trying to alter the state of that protein with. So it um, goes back to the, sort of the lock and key principle around um, proteins and their function and how you can modulate that. Okay, so if you're designing a drug, you're looking to create a molecule that will... Uh, affect certain change. Yes, and will fit into a certain slot in that protein and affect its its uh, uh, function in the body. Just to situate it for for me, um, you know, what kind of pharmaceuticals would we be talking about? Oh, for for the example I just described, you're sure. you're looking at things that are small molecules that affect um, many different things. Um, a, a lot of uh, many targets within the body are based on that principle and. Um, you're mostly looking at things that would be small molecules you'd be used to, like Prozac and things like that. At the same time, though, <clears throat> we're starting to get much more sophisticated in the types of molecules that are used to impact those proteins. So you're looking at larger molecules, and you still want to understand their function, and you can derive some of understanding through understanding their structure. So it's all the way up to very large proteins that are therapeutic. Uh, so that's And that's one example of sure. how it's used. There's other uses. People are looking at how products are formulated, and that has to do, what you're trying to understand there is, what do the structures of the crystals look like? Because it has an impact on their function again. So the form you have, the size of the crystal, the shape, 
uh, how they aggregate has an impact on how they'll behave when you put them into the system you're trying to get them to impact. Okay, so this is essentially growing a large molecule uh, as a crystal. It is growing a large molecule, but you're, it's, what's happening is you're getting many molecules to come together and kind right. of align in a consistent pattern. Okay, and now what's that have to do with space? Well, that's a great question. So uh, when you crystallize things on Earth, there's a lot of dynamics that are impacting how those, those molecules come together to form a crystal. Right. And uh, what you really want is um, a very even, consistent surface and the area around the surface where the molecules are orienting themselves and then coming and adhering to the, to the surface of that crystal and growing it out. On Earth, there's a lot of other uh, dynamics, especially associated with gravity and its impact on how um, heat is transferred and uh, other dynamics and solution that impact that. Whereas in space, you've eliminated a lot of those and you're getting straight down to diffusion forces or diffusion action where the molecules, the only thing keeping them from adhering is just coming into position and finding that. There's no other... Uh, turbulence, let's say. So basically, you just get gravity out of the way, and the crystals can form more easily. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And you, you know, and the hope is that you're getting um, crystals that are forming in a more regular, ordered pattern, right? And larger crystals. Now, so what are the manufacturing implications for that? You know, does that mean that you know ultimately you have to produce these drugs in a uh, in a zero gravity environment? So, so for the first part, we're just trying to discover the protein and understand it. Right. We're not really in production. Where you're going and trying to do form, you're trying to get um, a consistent form. There you're trying to understand the factors that affect it. Does gravity really have an impact? In some cases, you may find that um, the effect of gravity isn't that great, or there are um, aspects of it that you can control on Earth, and that's what you're shooting for. There are cases where people have actually done crystal growth, and this is for inorganic systems, like making um, uh, silicon carbide cutting tools, where they can get a much better crystal, a harder um, cutting edge, if they grow those in a microgravity environment. So what they've done is they seed it, they make the initial, the part that would hook onto the cutting device and the um, initial piece of the blade and then they put it in space and they grow the rest of the blade there. Um, we're still a ways off from doing something that's um, ultimately practical as far as production, but you can see that for a lot of the things that are happening on the ISS, that is, we are working towards that. That is what we're in the midst of. It's kind of an exciting time when you think about it because you've got um, some great science going on and great possibilities and this um, platform that is up there and is becoming much more accessible. So if you, uh, I'm just looking at it from the standpoint of where um, I got engaged with the ISS maybe four years ago right. through my my, the, my previous employer, and um, and now you've got a vi almost a routine and consistent way to get things up there. It's happening on a regular basis to the point where um, you can start planning out not only your experiments but follow up experiments because it's become that routine. And that's one of the benefits of being a national laboratory is, is being able to have independent investigators and, and also commercial Absolutely. investigators get their work up there. Absolutely. This sounds like a, a really interesting and completely unique experience of, of conducting research through someone else's hands in space. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a very different experience. You know what, in some ways, maybe it's um, what we should um, have expected and the way we should... Um, uh, have thought of doing research all along, but for myself, I'm a, I, I was a hands-on chemist and I was trained right. as a chemist and used to going in the lab and doing these things. But you can see um, on on Earth, it's starting to change. Where you go in and say, "This is what needs to be done." You can go through, you know, a vendor or somebody to do it. But this is the extreme. This is where <laughs> yeah. you know you've got and and um, for some things, it's uh, it's you would think that you're missing a lot because you weren't there to see it, right? You didn't get to see it happen. But that's not even a factor anymore either because everything can be recorded at very high fidelity. And, and one of the things I've noticed is in the past you would run an experiment on, you know, with your hands on the, on the ground. You would then launch it up there and it get run. And you would tell the people up there on the space station, this is how I want you to run it. And 
and you've got to run it exactly like I did because I ran the control on Earth. Right. Well, what's <laughs> changed, so what you do is you run it on station first, and they're the control. And then you repeat it on the ground, which is a much easier thing to do, and then do the comparison between the two, if that's what you're trying to do. Oh, that's so, really so you So you switch it around. So it is, it's remote, but now you're, um, the remote person is doing the control. And then you're the one who's repeating it. It's changing it around. It's a it's an interesting time to be a scientist for sure. Yeah, and so you know, it seems like a really important step is then for everyone to step outside of uh, you know their individual silos and get together and talk and share. Absolutely. And, yeah, and that that kind of thing happens here. Yeah. So what happens in the form of you know the presentations and the 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 symposia, but it also happens with just people stepping aside and saying, "Hey, what did you do? And yeah. How did it work?" And we'll look uh, very much forward to those next developments. Uh, Thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome. And my last chat of the day was with Dr. Jonathan Clark of Baylor College of Medicine and the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. He has a long history at the forefront of research on human health in zero gravity and high altitude environments. And we talked about his presentation from earlier that same day on very high altitude balloon jumps and their role in the research. First of all, thank you very much for joining me. Sure thing. Love to be here. Um, So I was hoping we could talk a little bit about uh, the talk you gave this morning, um, in particular high-altitude jumps um, from balloons. Sure. What's the history there? When did that start? Well, I mean, ballooning actually was the first time humans left the planet. Uh So we we talk about going to space, but the first time they actually left the planet was in uh, 1783 in Paris. And uh, they used hot air balloons, and a week later, uh, another group uh, had a helium or a hydrogen balloon. So when they left the planet, and they were only up a couple thousand feet, uh, people who did it were absolutely mesmerized by it, and became what they called a balloonacy. That where people were, you know, literally, this was the hot thing to do. Right. Now you know, fast forward a couple of uh, centuries, and now. Ballooning has is very you know uh, commonplace, and now space is the hot thing. What are some of the effects on human health of being up that high? Obviously, higher than a thousand feet. Well, you know, when we go up in a plane, it's pressurized, so we don't feel the effects of altitude. But if you've ever gone skiing, a say above ten thousand feet, and you get that kind of you know uh, uh, um, headache, and you know just. You know, it's it's a mild form of hypoxia, which is a reduced uh, oxygen to your brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, going to altitude, even for short stays, uh, you can adapt pretty quickly. You know what they call mountain sickness. A lot of what the you know American Society of of uh, Gravitational and Space Research does is 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 trying to understand the adaptiveness of systems, whether it's plant systems, animal systems, or human systems. Yeah, and, so, and, and so what role in the present day um, does you know, high-altitude ballooning um, play in understanding those systems? Well, high-altitude balloons are a way to get to an area in our atmosphere that's actually very few people have been. There have been you know, over 550 people who've flown in space and gone to orbit. Yeah. But there are very few people that have spent time in the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is this kind of neglected area. It's the, it's the part of the ocean, the, the, the new ocean of, of space that very few people have gone. So balloons are our way to get there relatively cheap and safely. That's, that's fascinating. And you know, what kind of questions are we answering or uh, problems that need to be solved in order to take people up to those heights? Well, it's a very, you know, like, like everything in life, you have to face the challenges. And the, the challenges are low atmospheric pressure and uh, extremely low temperature. So, you know, we're talking minus 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And we're talking pressures that are, you know, 1% of our atmospheric pressure. Interestingly enough, you know who's now interested in that? People that want to go to Mars... That same, that's about the pressure of Mars. It's about 1% of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. So actually, near space, going up to, say, 100,000 feet, is very similar to what it would be like on Mars. Very cold, very low pressure. So now they're saying, oh, that's a good way for us to study Mars environment, cold, cold temperatures, low atmospheric pressures, right here on Earth. 
That, that's fascinating. So it, it can kind of serve as almost a model system. Absolutely. It's an analog, essentially, of the Mars environment. And that the NASA has a scientific balloon program that's basically trying to exploit the near space. You know, space is 100 kilometers, and right. near space is, you know, everything below that. And why don't you tell me a little bit about your talk this morning? Uh, it was focused on uh, two major jumps from these you know, high-altitude balloons. Obviously, going up there is one challenge. Jumping from it and surviving it is another altogether. Um, what did you talk about this morning? So, so I'm a physician, you know, uh, and uh, my clinical background is neurology, but my uh, operational background is aerospace medicine. Mm -hmm. And I was in the military, did high altitude parachuting, you know, 25, 30,000 feet jumps for this was military special forces. I went to NASA and was there eight years, and I was a, a shuttle crew surgeon. And what are the shuttle crew? wear when they go to space and come home. They wear a pressure suit with a parachute and a bailout system. They have the ability to bail out of the spacecraft if it has a problem. So um, believe it or not, my background has been all along in, in pursuit of these high altitude uh, uh, parachute jumps in the stratosphere. It's just part of my natural career evolution. So so the, the, the interesting thing is in um, uh, 2008, uh, Felix Baumgartner, who was a Red Bull athlete, had gone to the head of Red Bull and said, I want to jump from a balloon and uh, go higher than Joe Kittinger did. Joe Kittinger was an Air Force parachute uh, test pilot. In 1960, he jumped from 102,000 feet. So he held that record for a very long time. He held it for 60 plus years. That's amazing. Absolutely. Um, and the reason he held it is, this is a pretty scary place to be. It's yeah. very, very dangerous. But in a sense, you need to do this if you want to uh, you know, validate the systems in order to use them for your space flight. Well, so what Red Bull did is that you know, they were going to pursue this, not as so much as a, a stunt, but as a flight test program. And mm -hmm. they enlisted a lot of people. Uh, in the aerospace community. So we did this as a, as, a, as a bona fide flight test program. The goal of which was once we did this, all that data would be made available. It was made available to NASA, the Air Force, and commercial space companies, anybody uh, in, in academic institutions. So we had a number of people that actually got their you know, master's thesis looking at this data. And I was just honored to be a part of it. Now, my, my role was to be the one that helped with the um, the health, the human health risks. And, and, and in reading about that, you know, I, I was I was fascinated to read on some of the knock-on research that was performed as a result. Um, you know, it, it seems to have informed a variety of fields of study, you know, including even physics and things like that. Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the, the technical advances that were made um, were, uh, first of all, we learned from everybody else's mistakes. And just to show you that uh, what happens when you go up in altitude, the pressure is reduced. When you get to uh, 63,000 feet or thereabouts, uh, water at body temperature goes from a liquid to a gas spontaneously. So it's, uh, it's called sublimation. And the specific medical condition is called ebulism. So that's the thing that had killed a number of people. There was a, several spacecraft crews, including the Columbia and Soyuz 11, who died from exposure to vacuum. And, and by performing these types of, of um, experiments and events, we're able to ensure that people will be safe in the future. Well, I mean, what we realized is you had to have a pressure environment, yeah. like a spacesuit or a capsule that's pressurized, that would absolutely hold its seal. Because if, if it lost its seal and, and started to leak, it wouldn't be like you can put on an oxygen mask like in an airliner. Yeah. It, you got a, about 30 seconds to get out of that uh, environment or you're going to perish. Uh, so we came up with some things that you could do. One is to always ensure a, a good seal, but we actually developed a medical protocol that if you did get exposed and you did have that damage to your lungs, mm -hmm. we could do an emergency treatment in the field to keep you alive long enough for your lung to, to, to regenerate itself. It's, it's not a permanent injury, but you can't live without oxygen more than a couple of minutes, no. maybe five, six minutes. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and just a sample of what people can learn about today. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, you bet. Thank All you. Right. 
And to close out the podcast, I wanted to share a bit more of my conversation with Dr. Martin Brennan, in particular covering ASGSR's membership and how those of you who'd like to get involved and attend next year's meeting can do that. All right, so we've just heard from some of the presenters, and I was hoping we could talk a little bit about the membership of ASGSR. So broadly speaking, who are the researchers and educators who become members, and what are some of the benefits of becoming a member, you know, other than discounted rates for you know, meetings like this where you can kind of learn about everything going on in the field? Yeah, well, since we're, we're, we're a 501c6, so um, life and physical sciences, the members are mostly from a lot, of, like I said, we have people from different countries, um, but they're mostly from the United States, um, and we do have a large student membership. The benefits, honestly, you get the, you know, the discount rate at the meeting, sure. but probably the biggest benefit is we do advocate on the Hill. We go to, in the U.S., we go and talk to the legislators and the executive branch about the importance of the research because, like a lot of research that we see these days, some of it is fundamental research that we do, some of it's applied, but a lot of the research funding is kind of in a questionable phase. So we go and we speak to our you know, lawmakers, our policymakers about the importance of the research. So that's probably the biggest benefit. Um, it's not a tangible benefit, but it's the biggest benefit that uh, we can get and we can talk about the importance of the research and what's, what's going on and why it needs to carry on. So this is an opportunity for members to also ensure that this sort of research is carried out in the future as well. Exactly, yep. Well, you know, I, I, I think you've, you've made a convincing case, um, and I'm sure that we've got listeners who might be interested in joining and learning more about the mission. So where should we send those listeners? Yeah, so we have a website. Uh, it's www.asgsr.org. Like I said, the acronym is ASGSR. So just uh, go to the website, and you can kind of see a little click a little link that says join and uh, we love to have new members yeah and i absolutely encourage all of our listeners to join and uh, get to the meeting too it's great so cindy thank you very much for joining okay and that nearly concludes this special episode of bioscience talks before we go though i wanted to leave you with some of the sounds from the meetings exhibit hall in it there were a number of implementation partners who do things like make the novel tools that are required for the type of research we've been talking about today and i thought it would be kind of neat to hear from them so i'll leave you with that and uh, here's some music as you go Um, we put them in our cold bags, which is similar to like an igloo cooler, and they range in temperature from minus 32 degrees Celsius to plus 37 degrees Celsius, just depending on the science requirement. Yes, so I'm Marie Elizabeth Barabbas. I'm the managing editor for the journal. Our editor-in-chief is Cheryl Nickerson. We publish many different types of research, biology, chemistry, and physics, anything to do with uh, the effects of gravity on um, life forms, on chemicals, on materials, and also the engineering and uh, experimental considerations that are required to do space research. But right here we're focused on space, and even in space we have lots of different applications, so we are showing uh, our plant growth systems, our, our environmental control systems, and then also the spacecraft that's going to get these payloads to space. Okay, so I'm standing in front of a really cool looking uh, Oculus Rift setup. Um, the headset. Oh, that's cool. And I'm, and I'm looking at a screen now um, that's showing what you're seeing in those goggles. Yeah, this thing uses Oculus Touch, which is handheld controllers. And it's uh, kind of like being an astronaut in that... You're there. I mean, I, I'm looking at the screen and I'm seeing, you know, you, you're using your hands to manipulate the environment and move around it. And, and this is the ISS. Can you tell me about this instrument that I'm looking at right now? Right, this is the uh, Raven surgical robot and um, can be teleoperated by someone at a distance to do very fine dexterous motion. So TechShot is, um, uh, what do we say, we're an innovation engine. So we're talking about automated uh, space research hardware. And we're developing a 3D bioprinter for the International Space Station where we can make you a new heart or liver. Okay, I hope I don't need either of those, but uh, but that's that's really cool. This is a mock-up of veggies. It's been growing fresh food, uh, lettuce, bok choy, uh, zinnias, flowers um, for the astronauts.